Hello fun people, I'm Isaac Carlson, and the decision to have Charming set up a big musical show to have Shrek publicly killed has always felt like one of the weirdest plans he could have come up with, but I think I finally understand it as well as I possibly can. I'm pretty sure I know why the self-absorbed mama's boy put in the effort to create a theatrical performance to take his revenge, so let's talk about it. But first, if you'd like to join this community of Disney, DreamWorks, and animation fans, then consider subscribing and supporting me over on Patreon. Over there, you can join the private Discord, get behind the scenes videos, and get your name featured in the credits of all my videos while also helping me to continue to make these discussions and spread magic. Links are down below. The more I look at Charming's dumb musical plan, because it honestly is not the smartest way of going about seizing Far Far Away, the more I see that this makes a lot of sense as the next step for Charming in a world without his mother in his life. The idea of him putting on this entire production to put himself in the spotlight I think aligns really well with the character, even if it didn't necessarily make the most gripping of Shrek stories. Without the fairy godmother, he was a lost egotistical prince who was just praying for an idea to allow his mother's dream to finally come to a reality. You see, Charming grew up with his entire life planned before him. Whether or not he was actually aligned to the throne is up for debate, but regardless, his mother, the fairy godmother, plotted likely before he was even born that he would rise to become king. There were decade-long plans that were put into place by fairy godmother to ensure Charming's happily ever after. The most prominent plot we are aware of for Charming was to have him marry the daughter of the king and queen of far, far away. The powerful fairy's ability to get Harold to marry Princess Lillian was what was always meant to ensure that Charming would be able to enter the royal family. Harold's debt was always meant to be leveraged to ensure Charming married King Harold and Queen Lillian's daughter Fiona. In a way, Charming didn't have much autonomy or free will within his own life. He was a good boy who obeyed her orders and embraced being molded into whatever he needed to be for her. For the longest time, he was required to use his dashing good looks, his endless night training, and refined behaviors to be the prince he was told far, far away deserved. When Charming was told to go save Fiona, he endured blistering winds and scorching deserts to scale the tower to save the woman he hoped to be his true love. At least, that's what he was told to believe. Through every step of that journey, he recited the storybook he had always been sold by his mother. He was on an adventure that she designed to put them into one of the most powerful positions in the world. Charming was passively taking the steps that he believed he had to take to be happy based on what his mommy told him. The typical classic heroic and handsome Prince Charming is played off as a whiny child. His mother speaks for him. He gets the medieval meal with the weapon and the little crown in the box. He throws tantrums and falls in line under his mommy's orders. While these behaviors wouldn't have mattered to Fairy Godmother if he had become king, since she would have been free to influence him to create any policy she desired. Without her in his life, he was lost. I can absolutely see how he felt like the villains at the Poison Apple. He saw those enemies of Far Far Away as wronged people like himself, which is why he's so willing to align himself with them. But he does this without really acknowledging that he had all the resources he could have ever desired growing up with his mother. And in fact, a lot of his family's success was aligning themselves with the people who would become powerful in Far Far Away by granting them magic which in turn indirectly created a lot of those villains. The fairy godmother stomped on those people who would inevitably make a series of bad decisions or just become full of evil in the process. But I don't think anyone really thought that through. And because of that, it just seems like the villains were clamoring for anyone to align them as a team to bring chaos and destruction to far, far away. Either way though, Charming was happy to use them as his army since his reputation, fortune, magic, and power had disappeared with the death of the fairy godmother mother, leaving him with nothing. While his great foe Shrek got to take on the duties of king and become a champion of the people, Charming was left crying in the alleys. Charming was literally forced to go work as a dinner performer who hated his life and now was ready to attempt to get out of it. With all that in mind, I don't think it's very shocking that when Charming finally decides to take his revenge with a band of villainous misfits, he targets far, far away, hopes to kill Shrek since he was the ogre who primarily contributed to his mother's undoing, and attempts to reinsert himself into the public's mind as a charming
charming prince. He hoped to take everything his mother wanted for him while allowing the fairy tale he had been sold on to be brought to life in a way that reframed him in the consciousness of Far Far Away. That's why, even after Far Far Away was under his dominion with the help of the villains, he was obsessed with the creation of a theatrical performance and desired for the show to feel as real as possible even though every action in the show was scripted. It just doesn't feel real enough yet! This seemed to be the first time he was making decisions on his own, so he was pulling from what he knew. Charming figured out a way where he could pretend to be a hero. Do I think there could have been better ways to reframe himself and seize power? Yes, I definitely think there could have been, but he was only familiar with the theatrics of plans instead of the actual planning of them. After living under the instruction of Fairy Godmother his entire life, Charming's idea of reality had been distorted. Charming was attempting to showcase who his mother saw him as through the show he puts on. But it's just riddled in tropes, poor acting, and bad singing, which meant that nothing that happened was going to resonate with anyone in Far, Far Away. His ideas of singing princesses and heroes, arriving in a clamshell like a god or a mermaid, and performing in a rigid, choreographed way may have felt right to Charming, but it was rejected by the audience. Far, Far Away saw through Charming's thinly veiled attempts to recharacterize himself and Shrek. Baby not honey lamb, I will slice this thing up like a hand. The only way Charming is really ever able to control the kingdom is through threats and fear, which really meant that his persona as a benevolent man could never return because everyone was able to see him as the entitled tyrant that the fairy godmother had crafted him to become. <laughs> He seemed to just be spinning out of control as he grasped at the little power and influence he had acquired in hopes of exacting some kind of justice for his mother. Do I think Shrek the Third gave us a very compelling villain story through Charming? I wouldn't necessarily say that per se. Charming doesn't have a lot of the charisma, creative ideas, and interesting satire that made Lord Farquaad and the Fairy Godmother so compelling. I don't think he contributed in a meaningful way to push the story forward. It seemed like anyone could have rallied the villains together and brought Far Far Away into anarchy or peace, which is supported by Artie pulling them away from their cause with a few sentences. But at the same time, I think his actions make a lot of sense with who he was established as in Shrek 2. I think he was just an unideal fit to carry a movie as the antagonist. DreamWorks kind of did a reverse Pixar and decided to focus on a secondary villain instead of a secondary hero in a follow-up movie. Which often doesn't work because secondary characters aren't designed initially to bear the weight of an entire story. I'm kind of baffled that they decided to choose the junior egotistical man-child to face Shrek after Fairy Godmother, but I think his decisions following her death make sense. Charming found allies, faced the people who had crossed him, and attempted to put on a perfectly crafted fairy tale musical performance like his mother had taught him. Prince Charming put on a show in the hopes that Far Far Away would embrace him as a noble knight and leader over Shrek, but instead he was panned by critics, choked during his show, and crushed by the weight of his final performance. But let me know down below what your thoughts and theories are surrounding Charming's musical plan. Do you think it makes sense? Also, make sure to subscribe and click the beautiful bell and then click on another magical video in the description or on the screen. Finally, as always, thank you to my patrons, thanks for watching, and have a magical day.